Okay, so yeah, so in today's session, what we'll do is uh, we will go through since this is a session that will be streamed on YouTube. What we'll do is we'll go through all concepts uh, in week four, starting from first lecture all the way till the end. So we will look at graphs in uh, great detail in this course, right? So several graph graph algorithms will be discussed. How do we represent graphs? We'll start with representing graphs using adjacency matrix uh, and adjacency list. Then we look at uh, two very important graph traversal algorithms, breadth first search and depth first search. Then we will move on to applications of breadth first search and depth first search. So these applications will involve talking about connectivity in graphs, right? So what, how, how connected are graphs? Uh, so that is one application. Then we look at uh, shortest paths, right? How can we compute shortest paths in graphs using uh, BFS? That is one application we'll be looking at. We'll also be looking at uh, another application on connected components, right? So how do we find subgraphs which are islands of connected graphs, right? So that is something we'll be looking at. We'll also look at how to find cycles in a graph. And uh, then we'll end with a concept called topological sorting, which involves directed acyclic graphs, right? So they are called DACs. So I am guessing most of you would have seen the videos, the lecture videos. Even if you have not seen, this will serve as some kind of overview or summary of what is covered in this week. So one thing which I won't do is I won't be coding this time. I tried doing that last time, and somehow I felt that didn't work well, right? So if you want to refer to the Python code, I think the best place is to go back to the lectures, uh, the slides that Sarah has shared, right? So he has given all the code there. Or the textbook, the PDSA notes that Atul has shared, right? So you can refer to that also. So this will more this will be more of a discussion of all the concepts in this week. Okay, I hope that is fine with all of you. So I'll go and start sharing my slides. Okay, so the first thing we look at is how do we represent graphs using some of the structures that we have seen in this course, right? So on the left, you have a directed graph, right? So this is a directed graph with edges going in going from 0 to 1, 1 to 3, and then 0 to 2, 2 to 3. So direction matters here. And uh, then what we call an adjacency matrix will look like this, right? So there are n nodes in the graph. In this case, there are four nodes, right? Four nodes. You have a four cross four matrix. And wherever there is an edge, that entry in the matrix will be 1. If there is no edge between a pair of nodes, then the corresponding entry in the matrix should be 0, right? So I hope uh, you all uh, are able to see this, right? So same set of nodes will be represented in both the columns and rows. So the this is 4 cross 4, as I said before. So from 0 to 0, there are no edges, right? So there are no self loops, as we call it. So if there is an edge from one node to itself, that's called a loop, a self loop, right? So there are no self loops. Assume that there are no self loops. So then this entry will mostly be zero. The diagonal entries of the matrix will typically end up being zero for uh, most graphs, right? So very rarely you'll find self loops. So this diagonal entries will be zero. And uh, here there is an edge from zero to one and from zero to two, so they are one. And there is no edge from zero to three. Okay, so all these, all the edges that leave out of a node are called outgoing edges, right? So for example, here, 0 has two outgoing edges, one that connects 0 to 1 and one that connects 0 to 2. So that is the outgoing edges. So if you want to find out the number of outgoing edges for a given node, you have to sum something. So can someone tell me what you will have to sum to find the outgoing edges, number of outgoing edges? using the adjacency matrix.
you will have to sum the number of you will, you will have to sum across the rows right so if you sum all the entries in a particular row you will get the number of outgoing edges right so that is for outgoing edges so the number of outgoing edges has a term for it separate term for it it's called the out degree right so the out degree of a node is how many edges exit out of that node correspondingly there is another no notion for in degree so that's the number of incoming edges so for every node if you want to find out what are the incoming edges you have to look at the columns for example if you take the node 3 3 has two incoming edges one from one and another one from two right so correspondingly you will have an entry of one in these two rows right so you have to look at the columns and if you sum the entries in the columns you will get the in degree so if you sum the rows you get the out degree if you sum the columns you get the in degree of of a node in a directed graph okay so this is with regard to the adjacency matrix n cross n matrix so you need of the order of n square space to store the matrix and uh, if you want to access if you want to know if there is an edge between i and j nodes i and j in the graph then that can be done in constant time right so for example if i want to know just using the adjacency matrix if i want to figure out if there is an edge between 1 and 2 i just need to look up the entry 1 comma 2 in this array or in this matrix so that's a constant time operation as you already should be aware of this is a you can treat this as a numpy array and looking up a particular entry in this array is constant time okay so finding if there is an edge between two nodes is a constant time operation so that is uh, one thing so this is adjacency matrix i hope i can tell you you're all clear with this if there are any questions you can stop me otherwise i'll assume that you are clear about all this and i'll keep going on okay so now the other way to represent graphs is to use a list right so to use what is called it's called an adjacency list this is again for a directed graph right so the way we do it is to maintain an array of array for the number of vertices or nodes so here again the same graph so you have four four nodes so you have an array of size four and for each array as so each element in the array you have a list corresponding to it that list will store the outgoing edges or or, or the nodes that go away from that particular uh, node right so for example zero is the first entry in the array and corresponding to zero what is stored in zero is a list right and that list contains all the outgoing edges by outgoing edges i mean the nodes corresponding to these edges right so so zero will store one comma two one will store three two will store three and three has no outgoing edges so the you store an empty empty list corresponding to that okay so you have to know both these representations of graphs you have to be able to move back and forth between these two so one convention that uh, we will follow i think we follow this in the course also is whenever you represent the adjacency list corresponding to a node or the list of vertices corresponding to a node you you have them in sorted order right so you could have written down zero as two comma one also but then you write it down as one comma two so that this convention is followed right so the list is represented in sorted order so that is the adjacency list now we have the same notions extend to undirected graphs also right so let's quickly look at them so one important feature of an undirected adjacency matrix is it is going to be its own transpose right so it's a symmetric matrix so corresponding to every edge so if you take the edge 0 comma 1 you will have an entry in 0 1 you will also have an entry in 1 0 right so one way to tell if a graph is undirected or not is to look at its adjacency matrix if the adjacency matrix happens to be symmetric then that particular graph is undirected. Okay, so that is uh, the only important point regarding the adjacency matrix for an undirected graph. 
rest of the argument remains the same so one maybe one final point here is uh, there is no concept of in degree and out degree here there is only a degree right so there is no direction to the edges so that is uh, one point so what is represented by rows and columns over here like in uh, directed i saw that like uh, we were taking rows for nodes and like uh, column for like um, the outgoing thing and then we were like we had created our columns and oh, sorry uh, this matrix but now i'm i can see that like since it is undirected so it is symmetric and like we are uh, filling both the sides of it like zero to one at the same time like uh, in rows and columns both so yeah so in both these cases the rows and columns represent the nodes okay. even in the directed case it represents the nodes only thing is that here it's not going to be symmetric so uh, the, the way you read it is still the same so is is there an edge from row when when you say when you read up this entry in row 1 column 1 sorry column 2 we are asking if there is an edge from node 1 to node 2 Yes, right. so I so, think rows are nodes and columns are like on which node like it is going. So, yeah, on which node the edge is incident on. So yeah, you can assume that both are nodes, right? So nodes, the edges leave this particular node and enter this particular node. Sir, but in direct, uh, in undirected graph, we can't say this nodes goes on the, on that node because it is two way. It's yeah, that is correct. That's why it's symmetric, right? So, uh, I mean, uh, rows and column both represent nodes. We can't say anything about it, which node goes on and something like that. Yeah, there's the concept of direction breaks down, but here also both of them represent nodes only, right? Only the, the, the way we read it is what makes it, the way we interpret the matrix is what gives the idea of direction here, right? So we say, there is an edge. If there is an edge from row I, uh, from node i to node j, then the entry in row i column j is one. That's the understanding, right? So, i comma j represents one entry in the matrix. It also represents node i and node j. If there is an edge from node i to node j, a i j equal to one. That's what we are saying, right? I hope that is fine. The the distinction is clear right for both okay so that's the adjacency matrix for uh, undirected graphs now yeah if you want to find out the degree right so there is no in degree out degree you have only the degree of a particular node you can just sum all the elements in a in a row or or the column right it will mean the same so it should give you the same output for example for node one you could either sum the row corresponding to one or column corresponding to one Okay, you'll, you'll end up getting the same sum. So that is the adjacency matrix for an undirected graph. Adjacency list, again, you you have this same representation as we saw for direct graph. So nothing different here. Okay, so we'll move on. Now we'll uh, take up the first of the graph traversal algorithms is breadth first search, right? So breadth first search is one of the two graph traversal techniques. So we will do an example and uh, see how how it works, right? So the idea in breadth first search is to take up a particular node, right? To start exploring the graph from a node. So it could be any node. In this case, let's say we, we choose the node zero. Right, we start exploring the graph from node zero. So the way we are going to do this is to maintain a queue, right? So every time we start exploring a node, or every time we encounter a node, we add it to a queue. Right? By, by queue, I mean first in, first out, right? So the queue. I hope from last week you 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 have you have read the uh, or. or Found out what a queue is, right? I hope that is clear to all of you. So whatever it's 
goes in first, that is the thing that will go out first. Right? So any normal queue that you find in, say, a railway station or whatever. Right? So that is exactly the same concept that we are using here. So you first enter 0 into the queue. And uh, you pop it. right? So while the queue is not empty, you will have to keep doing certain things. So the first thing that you do is you pop the queue. So when you pop the queue, it's the same as saying remove the topmost element in the queue. right? So Elements or nodes enter from left to right, and they they go to the other side of the counter. You can think of this uh, vertical line as a counter. So zero is now going to step out of the counter, and now you have started exploring zero. Right. So we have started exploring zero. Now you are going to look at all the neighbors of zero to begin with. Right. So you have two neighbors, one comma two. Right. One and two are the neighbors of zero, and uh, Every time you encounter a neighbor or a node that has not been visited, right? so far only zero is, has been visited. Right? Every other node has not been visited. So you are now going to look at one and two. One has not been visited. So what do you do? You add one into the queue. Right? So you add one into the queue, and you, main, you maintain a variable for corresponding to that and say that it has been visited. OK, so one has been visited. Now next, you go to the second node. That is a neighbor of 0. And that is 2. So 2 is not yet visited. So now you add 2 to the queue. right? Every time some node is, you, you visit some node, and it's not yet visited, you add it to this queue. right? So now you add it to the queue. So notice that we are also doing another operation here where Every time we, we we add a node to the queue, we are also keeping track of who the parent of that particular node is. Okay, so the parent of a node is the node from which, or, or the node from which that particular uh, vertex was first explored. Okay, so for example, the parent of one is zero because one was first discovered by zero. Right, so while I was exploring zero. I came across one, therefore, zero is the parent of one, and I make note of that here. Likewise, for two, zero is again the parent. Okay, so you do two things every time you visit a node. You make you mark that node as visited, you add it to the queue, and then you mark its parent. Okay, so I, maybe I should say that we do three things. Every time you visit a node, you in, insert it into the queue. You make sure that it has been visited, and then you mark who the parent of that node is. Okay, so you do this. Now you look at zero again. There are no more nodes that it is connected to. Okay, so therefore you can move on to the next iteration of your breadth first search process. Right. So now you pop one, or you next next element in the queue is one. Okay, you have inserted from left to right. You have to remove from right. So you remove one. Now you repeat the same process. You look at the neighbors of one. So zero is a neighbor of one, but zero has already been visited. OK, so if something has already been visited, you don't again add it to the queue. Okay, that will be wasteful computation. So you skip zero. You look at the next neighbor. Three is the next neighbor. So you add three. Three has not yet been visited. So you add three to the queue. That's the first thing you do. Then you mark it as visited. That's the second thing. The third thing is you make you mark the parent of three. So three was visited from one for the first time. Therefore, one becomes the parent of three. Okay, so now this is this is how the queue looks like. One, then you go back to one, right? So one has no more neighbors to visit. All neighbors are visited. So you can go to the next step of the process, which is two, right? You know, take two out of the queue. Again, you take it from the right. Insert from the left, Take, remove from the right. So you look at two's neighbors. 0 has already been visited. 3 has also been visited, right? It's it's currently in the queue. So 3 has also been visited. So there's nothing more to be done. And you can move on to the next iteration, which is 3. Okay, So you pop 3 out of the queue. And uh, you realize that. Again, three neighbors have already been visited. So you now you realize that the queue is empty. OK, 
okay the moment the queue becomes empty that means you have come to the end of your breadth first search process and you terminate the algorithm there okay so you have visited all nodes so this is called breadth first search because you are kind of sweeping through in a breadth first man so you you are you are sweeping through all neighbors of a node and then you are going to the next level of neighbors you are doing it kind of horizontally right so from left to right so if you think about this i am sweeping through this horizontally from 2 to 1 and then i'm going down to the next level which is 3 so i'm doing it in a breadth wise manner instead of depth first which we will see in a while okay so is this uh, execution of uh, bfs clear to all of you are there any questions okay so what we'll do is uh, we will move on to the next so yeah hello. yeah uh, sir, uh, like you explained, we have bread for search, but uh, in the tutorial, sir, I have explained in another manner, I guess. Uh, uh, so, can you explain in that way also? Uh, which tutorials are you talking about? Uh, for the bread for search tutorial, like in video lecture. Okay. Uh, what, what was that? I'm sorry, I have not seen that tutorial. Okay, uh, so actually, uh, actually, he was taking some slide, and uh, uh, there uh, he was the, uh, marking the notes like a visitor and non visitor. Okay, okay, right. So I think both you could do it both ways. See, what I'm doing is the the way I've done it is the moment something enters the queue, you already mark it as visited right so that's the fundamental idea so you, you have a queue which is you always start bfs from some node so in this case i am starting it from node zero right so every time a node enters the queue you do three things right you mark it as visited and you are going to update its parent okay so those two things you are already doing. So zero has no parent, and you are you already assume that your market has visited because it has entered the queue. Okay, and after you remove remove it, the fact that it has been visited never changes, right? So everything that is outside the queue is by default visited. I mean, which has not yet been inserted, right? So all, anything that you see that to the right of this vertical line, you can think of that as visited. So that is my way of. Uh, marking that a particular node has been visited. Okay, so now zero has been visited. Uh, I'm exploring the neighbors of zero. So one has been visited, two has been visited. The moment it enters the queue, it has been visited. And then you pop or remove one. Okay, so that, that doesn't change the fact that zero has been already visited, right? So that remains visited. So you could think of it this way also, right? I mean, I can. So, just a doubt. Like uh, after zero, uh, one and two both are neighbors of zero. So, when we move after zero, so we will say that one and two both are visited. Exactly. So, you the moment you enter, you you start with zero, and then you look at the neighbors of zero. So, what do you mean by this whole visited thing? It means. I have taken note of one. Okay, I have taken cognizance of this node one, and I have entered it into the queue. So the process of entering it into the queue coincides with the process of visiting it. So it's like think about it this way. I am you are you are zero. Think of these nodes as persons, right? So one is my friend, two is my friend. So I'm I have come to a party, and uh, I have already like I have seen one. Okay. I've seen one and I've told him that I'll talk to him later, go and stand in the queue. It's, it's like that, right? So every time you you visit a friend, one of your a friend is someone who's connected to you, right? So the moment you visit your friend, ask him to go stand in a line, that means the visiting part is done. Okay, so you, you can think about it that way. So one and two are now visited. Is that uh, reasonable? Yes, sir. Okay, any other questions about the BFS execution? Okay, so we'll move on then. So this is 
See, one important point, you have to read the question properly, depending on different uh, outcomes of BFS are possible. For example, here I visited 0, and then I added 1 and 2. I could have added 2 and 1 also. right? So there is no reason why I should not choose 2 above 1. Okay, So I can I will end up with a similar looking graph. But uh, one convention we follow is we visit the neighbors in ascending order. Okay, I visited uh, the neighbors of 0 in ascending order. Therefore, uh, this is what you get. OK, so likewise for 2 also. So 2, you when you are looking at 2, you will first look at 0, and then you look at 3. Since 0 is already visited, you can skip that. And I think 3 also is visited, right? so you can skip that. But remember that this ascending order is important. OK, once you do the BFS, are all the edges in the original graph present in this particular graph on the right? Or is there anything that is missing? So if you notice this 2, comma 3, that edge is missing, right? So this edge is missing. So all missing edges, I'll represent it this way, this, this kind of uh, curvy edge, OK? So this. 0, 1, 1, 3, and 0, 2, right? All these edges are called tree edges. They belong to the tree. So this is called a tree. So breakfast search tree. So this is called a BFS tree. Every execution of BFS on a graph will result in what is called a BFS tree. So what is a tree? Tree is a connected graph without any cycles, right? So it's so this, if you think about it, this is a connected graph, right? So you can reach every node from every other node on the right. So I'm talking about the graph on the right-hand side. Left-hand side is also connected, but then it has a cycle, right? So the left-hand side, the graph on the left is not a tree. It has a very simple cycle of 0, 1, 3, 2. Whereas the graph on the right is a tree because it connected and acyclic, right? It's not cyclic. So every BFS execution will return what is called a tree. And the node from which you run the BFS, right? So I run BFS from 0. So that is called the root node. So this is a tree that is rooted at 0. I'll repeat this. So what you get is a tree that is rooted at 0. So 0 is called the root. The root will not have any parent. Okay. So the root's parent is null or non existent, right? So root, root will have children and every other node that you can think of in a tree will have one parent, exactly one parent. OK, so I hope. Uh... Uh, so yeah. Uh, so here, first you have connected that two and three no uh, nodes. Uh, so it will be connected here or not? It won't be connected here, right? So this particular execution of BSS, B, sorry, BFS, sorry, BFS, sorry. Uh, this particular execution of BFS didn't add the 2, 3 edge. Okay, that is not a tree edge. So the way the notation is, uh, or terminology is tree edge and non-tree edge. So this is not a tree edge. OK, only uh, parent node will be connected like that. Uh, so here, 2, 3, see, if you, if you had run it slightly differently, right? So 0, instead of visiting 1 first, if you had visited 2 first, right? 0, 2, 1. Then you would have connected two and three. So, is it uh, is it possible that instead of uh, going to one, uh, we move to two first? Yes. That or is... order. Okay. What, that what... is also possible. Yeah. What I'll do is I'll uh, I'll take up. I'll just for this case alone, I'll do one more execution of BFS, but uh, without in a slightly different way, right? So this is this is a node. Now there is one more node. What is this graph here? Uh, 0, 1, 3, 2. Right? So 0, you have 1, you have 2. Okay, so this is the graph. Now this is directed now, so I'll remove the edges and make them undirected. 
so it becomes an undirected graph now sorry so removing a added edges uh, yeah so now what we can do is we can start bfs from zero but instead of visiting one and two we can visit two first right so i think stops us from doing that so now zero two is two parent is zero and then the next neighbor of zero is one okay so i add one so in the queue if you think about the queue two is ahead of one in the queue i visited two first and then only i visited one so two is ahead of one in the queue and therefore the next element that is going to be removed from the queue is two now i look at two's neighbors so two's neighbor uh, there is only one non visited neighbor okay so that will be three so if you now compare this graph and this one so 0 1 so 1 3 is not a part of this breadth first search tree uh, that means so uh, for this particular bfs there are two queue uh, possible there are uh, two trees possible yes two trees yeah two, two trees possible and you could so extending this you could also start bfs from any other node right so i could for example i could have started from 3 so that depends on how you call the bfs function so if i start from 3 then uh, if i follow ascending order of node visits i'll visit 1 first and then i will visit 2 uh, okay and then i'll visit 0 right so 0 will go to 1 so i i'll first visit 1 and then uh, i'll visit 2 but 1 ahead of 2 in the queue so from 1 i'll visit 0 okay now it's a totally different uh looking tree it's rooted at 3 yes it's clear okay so, so one more thing uh, yeah like uh, you have mentioned cyclic and acyclic graph uh, can you explain little bit more please so this is a cyclic graph you have a cycle right you start from 0 and you come back to 0 there is a path or rather there is a yeah there is a path 0 to 1 1 to 3 3 to 2 and then go back to 0 so that's a cycle Whereas if you look at this graph on the right, there is no cycle, right? There is no matter how what kind of sequences the sequence of edges you take, you can never get back to the same node. So that means trees are always acyclic. Yeah, trees are by definition connected acyclic graphs. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, so that is BFS. So cyclic or acyclic is all with the directed graph, no? It's it it works for both directed and undirected graphs, but a tree is typically an undirected acyclic graph. So for a directed acyclic graph, you have a separate terminology called DAC, right? Which we will be looking at. DAC. Okay. Okay. So that is. But you were telling that one at the convention we will go with the ascending order, right? And right. Selecting the nodes. Yeah, we're selecting the nodes. Yeah. Nodes. If that being the case, your alternative case, what you have shown, is not in con in alignment with the convention, is it? That is right. Yeah. This this particular execution of VFS is is a valid. It's it's it is still VFS, but then we have just uh not stuck to the convention of yeah that's the point i'm telling when you say it's a convention is it breaking the convention is not non valid act we are doing mm, well so in theory this is not wrong right so it is it just breaks the convention conventions are for our convenience right so Uh, we should be able to sometime also step out of these conventions uh, but uh, i think i'll check this with atul i think our course follows uh, this kind of ascending ascending order of uh, our course, course follows a convention no yeah right so yeah that point alone i as i said I, uh, before the or at least during the first revision session or before uh, the quiz one we mm -hmm. will confirm that with you whether uh, we are following this ascending order uh, for graph uh, 
no traversal or not okay but for this session please assume that we are going to stick to ascending order of traversal okay okay sir thank you okay so that is the depth first sorry breadth first search tree bfs tree and this 2 3 is not a part of the tree right i have included 2 3 just to show you that there are nodes in the graph which are not there in the tree okay now we come to dfs right so same graph we will we'll do a depth first search so the idea as, it, as you can see is you keep going deeper and deeper instead of going broader right so this time what we are going to use is a stack okay so instead of a queue the stack the last in first out right whatever was the last entry you pushed into the stack that will be the first that you remove out of the stack so entry and exit are both through the same point right so left entry left exit so as usual you can run dfs from any node so we will start dfs from node 0 so you add node 0 to the stack okay and uh, while the stack is not empty so in bfs the the algorithm was you keep doing something while the queue is not empty right as long as something is there in the queue keep running the algorithm here as long as there is something in the stack keep removing elements from the stack okay so first we put zero into the stack that's the the proper term for that is push zero into the into the stack so once you push zero into the stack now stack becomes non-empty and your algorithm begins so remove the first element that you see in the stack okay you, zero is that so sorry uh big, bigger pardon so what what we are doing is uh, we we push zero into the stack and then we start exploring the nodes okay uh, that particular node so you start exploring zero so again ascending order of neighbors one and two are your neighbors so one is the first one you visit so you what you now do is push one into the stack okay you're you're pushing one into the stack while simultaneously marking zero as the parent of one okay now what you do is you forget Sorry, all ago you were referring this one as a queue now you are talking with a, with a stack yeah both are same queue and stack are same and uh, no no queue is so in queue if you remember you are entering things entered from left to right but then this this is like a counter right you once your job is done you exit the counter on the right right so that is a queue here it's a stack so things will not leave the stack uh, in this way right they'll only leave the stack from the left so you can only enter and exit on the left let me this will not cross the vertical line yeah it won't it should not cross the vertical line yeah so in that case it is called as a stack is it yeah a stack is you can think of it as a stack of books right you can you can only keep adding books on top of each other you can't remove the last book on the stack right? i mean you can't remove the bottom most book on the stack right if you want to remove it without toppling or disturbing the stack the only way is to remove the topmost keep removing yeah. the topmost books right so that is the idea of first stack. in first out or last in first out that's the one you are referring to yeah yeah this is the last in whatever was entered last that is the first to be removed okay so zero is the first thing to be pushed into the stack now you start exploring the nodes neighbors of zero first neighbor is one you enter that into the stack now what you do is you completely forget about zero and you start exploring the neighbors of one okay so the first neighbor of one is zero but then zero has already been visited so again you have to keep track of who has been visited and who has not been visited okay so you have, you, you have visited zero so you don't need to go and visit them again you, you can start visiting three okay so you push three into the stack simultaneously marking one as the parent of three okay now you abandon one temporarily and start visiting the, the neighbors of three so one has already been visited two has not been visited so you add two to the stack you push two into the stack and then what you do is you mark three as the parent of two okay so so far what you have done is you have kept on visiting new newer and newer nodes while temporarily abandoning 
earlier notes right so you are now at node 2 at node 2 what you see is both the neighbors are visited zero is visited three is visited so there is nothing more to be done so you pop two from the stack so this is also the term is pop other other ways to say that you remove two from the stack so throw two out of the stack because you are done with exploring two you backtrack so this is the again technical term backtrack meaning go back to the place where you left off right so you had temporarily suspended exploration of the node 3 right you had you were exploring 3 and you had gone to 2 now your job at 2 is done so you go back or you backtrack to 3 so from 3 you continue exploring but you realize that 2 has already been explored right so there's nothing more to be done so you backtrack to 1 so you pop 3 from the stack you backtrack to 1 now you see that 3 and 0 are already explored right nothing more to do you pop 1 from the stack and finally you are left with 0 right now all all the neighbors of 0 are already visited so nothing more to do so you pop 0 from the stack the moment the stack becomes empty your exploration is complete right you can terminate the algorithm and say that you are you are done with bfs Okay, so this is uh, one execution of text first search on this undirected graph here. And what you get as, as the result is a DFS tree. This is called a depth first search tree. So now notice that again, one of the edges is missing. In this case, 0 to 2 is missing, right? So 0 to 2 now is not a part of the depth first search tree. Okay, so that is one execution of DFS. Now also notice that both BFS and DFS result in different objects, right? So they result in different trees. And uh, here, so you have this deep structure. So the, the depth is kind of reflected in the DFS tree, if you can, if you can see that. Whereas here, the breadth-first nature is reflected. Of course, this is a very small graph to run DFS and DFS on. But if you run it for a much larger, more densely packed graph, you will realize uh, the way the, the two traversals uh, differ. OK? So the, the point to notice, BFS and DFS need not return the same tree. OK? So they they may end up returning different trees. and Depending on the application, you have to choose which one you want. Okay, any questions here? If not, I'll move on to applications of uh, BFS. No, sir. Okay. Okay, so we look at the next, uh, the, there's a whole host of applications. We'll discuss one by one. So that is the first uh, topic or uh, concept is called that of a connected component, right? So you are looking at an undirected graph. And uh, so far, we have looked at this undirected graph, right? And it was connected. So the graph was entirely connected. You had no part of it that was dis like disconnected or not connected. Whereas if you look at this graph, right? So there are, there seem to be two subgraphs in it, right? So you can very clearly make out that there is one island here that is connected. There is another island made up of 4, 5, 6, 7, nodes 4, 5, 6, 7. And both these islands are connected. So we call these connected components. Okay, so, this is, so each connected component is a maximally connected subgraph. What I mean by that is if you keep, if you add one more edge, sorry, one more node from that big graph, this will no longer be connected, right? So for example, you have 0, 1, 2, 3, right? The subgraph made up of 0, 1, 2, 3. Even if you add one more node from this bigger graph, right? If you add the node 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 will no longer be connected. OK, so 0, 1, 2, 3 forms a component. 4, 5, 6, 7 forms another component. Now your job is to find out how many connected components are there in your graph. OK, so this, this is the problem that we have to solve. Okay. Now, if you have 
seen the lectures you would know what to do so what we do is we run any one of these two algorithms we have seen right traversal algorithms either breadth per search or depth per search we run it on every node of the graph that has not been visited so far okay so it will become clear as we execute this let, let us start by running bfs on node 0 okay now i'll ask you to complete this so i have added zero and what what will be the next element that goes into the queue three two sir okay three, three, three and two but two first we are doing yeah. yeah if you say, if you follow ascending order it is two right so two is you pop the uh, queue and then you start exploring zero so two comes first right in ascending order we can take any of them no, sir. It's, it's not necessary that we should take two yeah but we have uh, agreed to follow a convention of visiting nodes in the ascending order yeah yeah yes sir. okay so we start with two and then what next three one two uh, we are doing bfs we are doing bfs uh, bfs we are doing it. If we do BFS, yeah. then we'll have to store both two and three in the queue, right? Correct. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. What is the next node that you will uh, add to the queue? So you have added two to the queue. So this was you pop is the queue. You are now exploring zero. You have added two to the queue. So what will be the next node you add to the queue? Three, three. Okay. So you add three to the three. queue and mark the parent of three as zero. Now, what is the next step? One. 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 Okay. okay. You pop the queue, right? So that's the next step. So you remove you remove two from out of the queue, right? So once you remove two out of the queue, then you see zero is already visited. So now I've added visited nodes on the top, right? So zero is visited. Now one is the next item to be added to the queue. Okay, you mark the parent of one as two. What is the next step? Three will get popped out. Yeah, three gets popped out, and the two goes back to this place. Okay, three is popped out, and now we are it's all it's done, right? So you know that three is already all neighbors of three are visited, and uh, you go send three to the right, and then you pop out one. One is also done, uh, and then the queue is empty. Therefore, the execution of BFS on this entire graph, starting from zero, is done. Okay, so this is one execution of breakfast search starting from node zero. Okay, so notice what happens when you start running BFS from a particular node, it is going to give you that component that zero is a part of. Okay, zero is a part of this component, zero, one, three, two, and all nodes that are reachable from zero will be visited right it will be explored so the entire component that zero is a part of will will be returned okay so i hope that's clear you got the first connected component by doing bfs from node zero now in principle what you can do is you can loop through the all you can loop through all the nodes right zero to seven eight nodes are there after you have done bfs from zero you can see if one is visited one is already visited, so there's no point of doing BFS on this. Two is also visited, so no point of doing BFS. Three is visited. Okay, so zero to three already visited. Now you go to four. Okay, four has not been visited, therefore you can run BFS on that. So you, you again start you you start another execution of BFS, but this time starting from node four. Okay, so the whole process now repeats. So you start uh, repeats, but for a different node. So four enters the queue, four is popped, and then you have five, six, seven, right? All three enter the queue. And then four is done. Uh, so you can put push four to the right here. And now you look at, you keep popping things. So you will notice that all, all the nodes are really visited. So it won't change the BFS tree at all. Okay, so you end up getting the second component 
here, right? So this is, you, you, you must remember one thing here. What we get here is not the entire component, but only a tree, okay? Only a tree and not the entire component. So for example, one comma three is missing from this, right? So one comma three is missing here, six, six, seven, that edge is also missing here. So what you get is called a depth first, uh, sorry, a breadth first forest. Okay, this is called a BFS, a breadth first search forest. It's called a forest because it's made up of trees. Okay, so there are two trees and these two trees make up a forest. So if you have only one, if, if your original graph itself is connected, then you will have only one tree. You, will, you don't need to call it a forest then. But if your original graph has two components, Okay, then what you will end up getting is a forest with that many number of trees. Okay, so this is a BFS uh, forest, and uh, the, you have no. This is your, yeah, go on. Will you say there are three here? Like this forest has two trees? Yeah, this forest has two trees. Okay. Okay, so. This is a BFS uh, forest. And uh, yeah, what I was uh, mentioning is, so how do you find out the connected components? You find it, you find out the number of connected components by figuring out how many times you have to run BFS. So here we have to run BFS twice, one on node zero and one on node four, okay? So the number of times you call the BFS on a node, on any node, right? So that is equal to the number of connected components in your graph. Okay, any question uh, at this stage? Sir, uh, sometimes means they are getting connected within the components, not across the components. Can you repeat the question? The connected components are connected within the component of it, not across the components. Yeah, if they were connected across the component, then you will not have two components. You will have only one connected component, right? You will have. So if, for example, if two and four were to be connected, then there will be no longer two separate components. You'll have one full connected graph, right? A single component graph. How, why do we give it to the connected component? Can a component, it's automatically connected. Yeah. Can it be stay without connection? It is, It is right? So two and four are not connected. So you can think uh, that of- is, that, is, that is between components. I'm telling within the component. Yeah, within so we getting connected only, no? Yeah, that's why it's called a connected component. No, no. My question is, why do you need to specify as a connected component when it cannot exist with a connection? Yeah, so you can call it components. If if you if if by component you mean the connection is implicit, then then yes, yeah, you can go ahead and call it a component. Alternatively, I am questioning that one: can a component be not connected? No, right. Uh, not uh, possible, is that right? Yeah, that is not possible because the component that is not connected doesn't, uh, like that's a contradictory uh, statement, right? So yeah. by definition, we call this a connected component. If you can reach any node in that subgraph from any other node in the same subgraph. So. Okay, it's a redundant term then. Yeah, so zero, one, two is, also connected. So subgraph 0, 1, 2 is also connected, but it's not a component because it's not maximally connected. So for example, I can just leave out the 3 and I can get a, okay, I can't do that here. So here, for example, 4, 7, 6. 4, 7, 6 is also connected. It's a subgraph that is connected, but you won't really call it a connected component because it's not maximally connected. I can add 5. That will give me an even more stronger version of a connected graph, right? So it's a maximally connected subgraph. Come again, please. What is the maximally connected? Maximally connected meaning, so 476, right? If you connect, if you look at the subgraph, 476. Right. That is also connected, right? If you can reach four from any of these two nodes, likewise. Yeah. But then you won't really call it a component because you can add phi and make it a bigger connected subgraph. Okay, so four, five, seven, six, you will call it a connected component. Okay, any connected subgraph is not a component, but 
a subgraph which is connected and has the maximum number of nodes possible, that will be called a connected component. So this whole thing here, I'll call it a component. Likewise, this whole thing here. All right. Got it. Thank right. you. Yeah, so we'll move on. So I hope this connected component was clear. So how many times is the way to find out how many connected components you have? Okay. So let's move on to next application, uh, which is uh, cycles, right? So cycles is also very simple once you have come this path. So if you have a graph like this, so clearly you have cycles, right? So you have multiple cycles, in fact. So 0, 2, 1, 3, 1, 2, 4, they're all cycle, cycles. Now, how do you detect if an undirected graph has cycles? Okay, so this is, uh, again, a courtesy BFS. You can just run BFS from any node. And we are going to run it from node 1, just for some variation, while sticking to our convention that we visit nodes in ascending order. Right? So we, we start from node 1. No, I am not going to show the queue, because by now you should have understood the flow of logic. right? So, so what so two comes first what next if you run bfs on node one dfs then zero oh B bfs 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 then four, four. Uh, three, 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 three 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 okay uh what next four and we'll backtrack and then four okay so one Zero, sorry, one, two, three, four. Okay, what is the next one? Then we'll backtrack and go to two, then zero. Okay, so we won't backtrack, right? We are we backtrack only in DFS. We keep looking ahead to the elements that you have added in the queue. So you would have added zero when you visited two. So or rather, I can say you finished exploring the vertex. Yeah, so you you finished exploring node one, right? Next, you take yeah. up two. Yeah. So you take yeah, you take up two because that's the earliest of the second level nodes. So this is the second level of nodes, right? The earliest of the second level nodes was uh, two, right? So you take up. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now what? So only thing that's remaining is zero, right? So you have to add zero, and its parent is two. So that comes to the third level. So so zero comes. What next? That's all, right? So that's it. That's it. So you can just stop it here. Now we just look at. So this is the breadth-first search tree. So you have the tree now rooted at one. So this is a BFS tree rooted at one because you ran the BFS from node one. Now you look at the non-tree edges, right? Those edges which are not a part of the tree. Two four is not a part of the tree, and three zero is also not a part of the tree. So these are non-tree edges. So in an undirected graph, if you run BFS and you find out that there is a non-tree edge, then immediately you can conclude that there is a cycle. OK, can someone tell me why that is, why that should be true? Moment you find a non-tree edge in a, in a BFS tree, that means that the original graph has a cycle. This is the plane. BFS, we visit the edge only once, each vertex only once. So if we are having this non-tree edge, that means we are visiting it twice. That would mean it's a cycle. So. OK, OK. All right. So another way of uh, saying this is BFS tree returns what? A tree, yeah, as its name suggests. So a tree is a connected cyclic graph. So a tree does not have cycles, but it's connected, which means between any two nodes in the tree, you have a path. Okay, so if you, if you take two, two and four, two one four, that's the path, right? In fact, there is a unique path between any two nodes in a tree. Okay, this is something you have to can think about, and it will also become obvious when you look at the way the look at the way the tree has been constructed, right? So there is a unique path between any two nodes in a tree. The moment you introduce a non-tree edge. Okay, moment you see a non-tree edge, that means one more path. 
okay so 214 is the is the is a tree path right a path that goes through tree edges but then you are saying that there is a non tree edge from 2 to 4 so i can go back from 4 to 2 okay i use tree edges to traverse from 2 to 4 and then i use a non tree edge to go back from 4 to 2 okay so every non tree edge will help you form a cycle okay, is that argument clear for everyone how you conclude that if there is a non tree edge then there is a cycle yes sir okay, okay. so so that is uh, with regard to cycles now let's look at another application of bfs which is the shortest path okay so we'll be looking at uh, shortest path in a very specific sense so what what do i mean by shortest path is how many edges are needed to go from one node to another node so if i want to go from 0 to 3 i need to tra traverse these two edges right so you can think of each edge as contributing to say uh, some cost right so i need to spend each edge is like take takes one hour to travel right so this may be a transportation network where all edges have the same duration of travel so zero to one takes one hour one to three takes one hour right so if i want to go from zero to three in the shortest possible time i need to spend two hours okay i could also go from zero to four four to seven seven to three that will take me one plus two one plus one three hours okay I can also uh, take three hours in fact i can take one two three four hours right if i go from zero four five one three okay but if i want to find the shortest path to reach three from zero that is going to be two hours okay so the reason i am emphasizing this is next week we'll be looking at several shortest path problems uh, where you will not just be looking at simple graphs like this you'll also be looking at what are called weighted graphs right where each edge has a weight so you must be you must not get confused between the shortest path and the shortest path algorithms that we study next week okay they are a totally different variety okay so how do we compute the shortest path again bfs comes to our rescue okay so i'm going to find yeah any questions okay so i'm going to find the shortest paths from the node zero okay so starting from zero i want to find all possible shortest paths right so notice that this zero is the name of the node and the underscore the subscript but not underscore the subscript is telling you the length of the shortest path okay you can reach zero in zero zero yeah. right so that you yeah you understand right so zero has shortest path zero okay that's the source okay this is called the source and uh, the source has length zero because you're already at the source you don't need to move at all now you run bfs so the okay can you tell me what is the first node that we will uh, add here one okay one so one is at level one okay you are visiting one this is the next level of the bfs so you mark that as level one what is the next node in uh, bfs four four okay four is also at the same level so, so if you recall the bfs algorithm you have to modify it as follows every time you visit a node you have to mark it as visited you have to mark the parent of the node you have to en enter it into the queue you will also have to increase its distance by one okay how do you increase its distance you have to make its distance one more than the distance of its parent you can reach your parent in a d time you can reach this child node in d plus one time okay one more edge that's the light that's the logic okay i hope that is clear yeah okay, so one and four are visited now what next in bfs mm, three three okay we go to three okay again three as three has been marked visited it has been entered into the queue 
it has uh, the parent of 3 is marked and the distance of 3 is one more than the distance of its parent okay so all that has been done okay then 5 5 okay what next 6 okay is it 6 or something else we explore from 4 onwards you explore oh, from that's correct okay, four, so, four, right so finish one level yeah, and we, only then we, yeah we finish the like the above level first and then go right four to seven yeah four to seven so seven is now going to be two okay four to seven is also at the same level as uh, level two what next eight four six. to five oh six six is now six, six. Okay, four is done, right? Five is visited. It was zero is visited. Seven is visited. So you, you are you are going to get rid of four and go back to the next element in the queue. So that will be three, right? Three. Yeah, three. Three is also done. So you go back to you go next to the element five in the that is six, right? So six is now at level three. So you add it. Okay, now five is done. Now you you pop six. That will be the last. So you'll you'll pop seven, but seven is also done, and then you'll pop six out of the queue, and eight eight will be the last node to visit, and its level will be four. Okay, so zero. So yes. so basically, the shortest pass is the number of levels in BFS. Right. Yeah, for each node, it's the number of the whatever level it is. Okay, so this gives you the shortest path from zero to any node in the graph. Okay, so this is the shortest path from zero to any node in the graph. Now, if if there is some node in the graph which is not a part of, it's not connected, right? So, for example, if you have a graph like this, the, the one that we saw here, right? So if you if you run BFS from here and you want to find the shortest paths, what you have to do is you have to set this as infinity, right? So zero is not connected to four, so you can never reach four. So there you have to be careful. So you can't reach four from zero. Okay, so that that yes. path will be infinity. Uh, infinity here means that you can't reach, no matter how how long you spend, you can never reach four from zero. Okay, so it's the shortest path yeah. algorithm clear how how you use bfs to find the shortest path yeah, yeah yes okay so that is the shortest path now see all this when we say it's an application of bfs we can do the whole thing right shortest path the whole you know determining cycles finding connected components all this can be done with very very small changes to the original algorithm for bfs Okay, so that's important to know. Okay, so we are done with the shortest path. Okay, now we go to uh, depth first search three. Okay, so this is a different set of uh, applications, which where we'll focus on directed graphs. Okay, so what I'll do is uh, just just give me some three four minutes. I'll come back at nine uh, fifteen. Okay, just. Four minutes. I will break and okay. resume.
Okay, so we'll assume. Okay, so this is a directed graph. Okay, so there is a directed graph, and we are going to. Uh, yeah, any questions so, so far? Uh, with respect to the in one of the lectures uh, in the directed cycles, uh, you explain about the forward, backward, and cross edges. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that is what I will be doing. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we'll be, so we'll take a directed graph and we look at the DFS. We'll execute DFS on it, and uh, after that we'll notice. So we we will while we run DFS, we'll also keep track of certain auxiliary variables, right? So some. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So that is what we'll be doing next. So here, let's again start from zero. We are going to so this is like fairly complex looking tree. Okay. So we'll start from zero. And uh, what we are going to do here is we are going to keep track of two numbers. So one is called a pre-index, you could call it index, and another one is called a post-index, right? So or I don't know what uh, Professor Madhavan what notation he uses. I don't know if he calls it index or not, but he uses these uh, variable names pre and post. Okay, so pre is just when you start, just before you start exploring that node and uh, Post index is just after you complete exploring that node. So you can think it's of this. In degrees, I guess. Sorry? It's in degree, I guess. Ah, uh, no, not degree. So it's uh it's not he doesn't this is not referring to the degree. It's more of when you can think of this as some kind of time uh, a counter, right? At what time are you entering a node? At what time are you exiting the node? So assume that time is starting from zero. So at time Time instant zero, you are entering node zero. Okay. Now you're running DFS. Okay, what will be the first node that you add as a child of zero? One. 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 Okay. So one is the first node. You're in your so whenever you move to the next step in your process, the time instant will get incremented, right? So you can think of integer time. So after time step zero, at time step one, you are visiting node one. Okay, so you are entering node one at time one, time instant one. So what is the next step? Next will be three. Okay, next will be three, right? You temporarily abandon one and you go to node three at time step two. Okay, you have moved on time step. So keep noting that as on the left top, right? This is your pre index because that is the one. When you enter a node, so you have entered the node at time step two. Okay, next what? What next? Two. Okay, now it's two. You temporarily abandon three, go to two at time step three. Okay, please don't get confused by the three, two, two, three. So this is node three, this is node two, and this is the time step, right? Now you are at time step three, so you are at node two. Okay. Now can I add zero here or? We will backtrack to zero and go to four. Okay, so we'll backtrack first to three, and uh, we'll backtrack. So since three is already done, we'll backtrack to one. From one, we can go to five. Yeah, from one we yeah. can go to five, right? So yeah. before we backtrack, right? So every time you go back, you have to increment. So you're exiting two, right? So we came to two at time step three, and at time step three, you know that. There is nothing more you can do at two. So at time step four, you exit out of two. At time step five, you exit out of three, and you go to time step six at five. So did everyone follow the sequence of exiting a node? So you visited a node, and then you are when you are exiting, you you similarly keep incrementing the post counter, right? This is the post when you are leaving a node. At time step four, I am leaving it. Time step five, I am leaving it. And then at time step one, uh, sorry, at time step six, I am not leaving one. I am exploring five. So therefore, this is entry at five at time step six. So we don't put six at one, but we put it at five. Yeah, because you have yes, not yet yeah. done with one, right? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So time step, you are doing two activities, huh? Yeah. When you are entering a node, that goes on the left top. That is pre pre time and when you leave a node, it's post time, right? So that is something you enter on the right top. So the right top is after like 
seeing the whole of the like traversing through all the elements and then going back then we put that yeah post. exactly yeah you put post after you have exhausted that particular node and you are back tracking to the parent of that node okay so you are uh, you are at node 2 you entered it at node at time instant 3 now you are done with 2 so you have exhausted 2 you can't go from you can't go forward so you have to go backward so you are done with 2 back track so at the time of back tracking you enter 4 here the same with 3 right you have you are done with 3 you can't do anything in the forward direction so you back track to 1 at that time you set the leaving counter as 5 now we are entering the one is explored yeah. yeah one is still being explored so therefore you don't disturb the end counter of one uh, so sir is it same as like when i am putting in the stack i'll put it in the left one and when i am removing it from the stack i'll put it on the right side ah uh, exactly yeah you are right so when when you are putting it in the stack whatever is the time time on your watch you enter that when you are popping it uh rather yeah when you are done with the execution that's when you pop right when do you pop uh, okay so this is a good question when do you pop from a stack in dfs once you are completely done you throw that out yeah so but you get the idea right when you are done with it you yes pop it and once you pop you don't insert it back again that's correct the, when you pop it you write down the right top Okay, so uh, I hope this is clear, right? We can can we move on now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you are at six. So at at from node five, where do you go next? Six. Okay, so you enter node six at time step seven, and then eight, right? So enter eight. node eight yeah. at time step eight. That's a coincidence. Now, what do you do at eight? We'll backtrack now. We'll okay. Do so, the... Correct. We'll backtrack. Yeah, nine. so this becomes nine. Okay, now we backtrack again because six has nothing left to offer us. So this becomes ten. Ten. And then we again backtrack. So five also 11. has ten. That becomes eleven. Now where do you backtrack now? One. Okay, one. one. So one is finally done, right? So one is exhausted. So you. Okay. So now where do you go next? Zero. Zero. Thirteen. That thirteen is that correct or something else is remaining? You can go to four from zero. Four, four, four. Correct. Right. So you are not yet done with it. Yeah. So you go to four. Four will be what? Thirteen. Thirteen. Okay, four. You enter yeah. four is thirteen, and then what? But when you backtrack to zero, you are not put thirteen. No, Sorry. Right? We because we have not exhausted zero, we are still exploring zero. The neighbors of zero. But you you traveled over there, is it? You backtrack, no? No. Uh, so you no you when you backtrack from a node, you change the uh, leaving the exit counter of that node, not the node that you are backtracking to, right? The node you are backtracking from is what you change. So for example, you are backtracking from eight to six, right? Therefore, you update. Nine here. You don't. You don't change this here. So I'm backtracking from one. So I have to update that one. Twelve. You are backtracking from one. Yeah. Therefore, you updated, right? So two to zero. But then you are not done with zero, right? You are continuing the exploration of zero. It is a directed graph, sir. So yeah. So you will be entering the value only on the are... new node explored, is it? Yeah. Only the Your whichever node you are exploring now, it's you update the pre counter. Okay. Okay. From four, where do you go? Oh, seven. 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 Right. One more node is remaining. So seven. So seven. You enter at fourteen. And uh, yeah, at this stage you are done with everything. So fifteen. Eight is covered. Sixteen. Seventeen. Seventeen. Yeah. Right, so if you have n nodes in your DFS tree uh, like this, right? So how many? What will be the total time that it takes? Seventeen. Seventeen steps. Yeah. 
yeah but if you have in general so how did this 17 come you can you express 17 in terms of the number of nodes 2 into number of nodes plus 1 sir 2 into number, number of nodes 9 sorry so 2 into number of nodes something minus 1 minus 1 minus, minus 1 right so for every node you have an entry and an exit but then you are start indexing from zero therefore that's your time starts from zero therefore 2 into n minus 1 okay so now uh, if this numbering is clear these are the pre and the post number numbering right so you could uh, okay, so why are what is the big deal so this helps us achieve so many things uh, the first first thing that it helps you do is classify the edges in your original graph okay so what is this this is your depth first search tree okay this is your dfs tree now notice one thing right so this is a directed tree so far what we have been looking at in, in all ex examples have been undirected uh, connected graphs which we have been calling trees but now this is a directed tree and uh, this is every edge in your graph that is a part of the dfs tree is called a tree edge okay i think this should be clear so zero to one is a tree edge one to three is a tree edge okay, these are all called tree edges because they are a part of the tree now let's look at those edges which are not tree edges okay they are they can be classified as forward edge backward edge or cross edges so we look at each each one of them so zero to one there is a there is a sorry no not zero to one there is an edge from zero to three if you notice in the original graph but which is not a part of the dfs tree so this is called a forward edge it's called a forward edge because zero is the ancestor of three okay zero is the grandfather of three or grandmother of three depending on what gender you want to ascribe to notes so zero is an ancestor of three whichever way you look at it and there is an edge from your grandparent to you or your ancestor to you therefore this is a forward looking edge Okay. I hope this definition is clear. So this is called a forward edge. Now, if you look at the next edge, there are two edges of this kind. So two to zero, two to zero is there in the original graph. Also seven to zero, right? So seven to zero is also there in the original graph, but which are not a part of the DF tree. Okay. So these are going to be called backward edges or back edges. So we have forward edge, these are called back edges. So 2 to 0 and 7 to 0. So the reason should now be clear to you, right? So I'm going from, so it's going from a descent. So if they are clear, then there is, yeah, yeah. okay, then there's one final edge, which is not a tree edge or a forward edge or a back edge, and they are called cross edges. So in this particular instance, 4 to Five, right? There is an edge from four to five in the original graph, and there is an edge from seven to eight in the original graph. These are neither forward edges, nor back edges, nor tree edges. Okay, so they are of, they are called cross edges. So you can see that they kind of cross between two different branches of your tree. So we could think of uh, as far as the tree is concerned. 4 is neither your, as far as the tree is concerned, 4 is neither your mother nor your father. 7 to 8 is not the two different branches, no? Yeah, they are two different branches of this tree, right? So, four, 5, 6, 8 is one branch, 7 is a different branch. No, 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 no. 8 can be with the 7 as well as 5, 6, 8, no? No, no, you, are, you should... You should look at the tree, right? So, as far as the tree is, the sure. tree is concerned, so zero to four is a forward edge. Or means you have to skip one. Means to be a forward edge, you have to skip one. One, one level up, right? Uh, mm, skip one as in as in skip one node. It's to be classified as a forward edge. Do you have to skip one node because zero to four should be a forward edge or uh, like no, zero to two is a forward edge 
Yeah, zero to two is no, no, no. Sorry, there's no edge from zero, but two to zero is a back edge. Okay, is there? Ah, uh, two to zero is a back edge, but what uh, the forward edge is? Uh, what did you say? The forward edge would be zero okay. to three. Zero to three. Yeah, zero to three. See the the. But zero uh, to one is not a forward edge, right? No, no, zero to one is not a forward. So the classification works like this, right? So there are three edges and not three edges. Okay, mm -hmm. everything that forms a part of the DFS three is a three edge. So that should be clear to you, right? So you you should not worry about all edges that are already present in your DFS three. So there are three edges. No, non three edges come in three types. It can either be a forward edge, meaning going from your from past to present right so it, it's looking forward so from zero you are looking forward to three so ancestor to descendant that is a forward edge or a back edge back edge is looking from descendant to ancestor right uh, yourself to your great grandparent so that is a back edge the other one is a cross edge which doesn't fit any of these descriptions that is 4 to 5 and 7 to 8 so why do you say 0 to 1 is not a forward edge because that is a part of the tree right so this this forward edge back edge cross edge is a classification only for edges that do not form a part of your tree edges that form a part of your tree are three edges 0 to 1 is a tree edge 0 to 1 is a part of the tree how do we really classify the tree edge and non tree edge anything that is a part of the tree is a tree edge mm -hmm. So zero to one is a part one of the to one to three is a non-tree edge. No, right? One to three is also a part of the tree. Ah, oh, that's I don't. I couldn't follow that one. How do we really identify a tree and non-tree? You identify so you know you understand the tree, right? This is a tree. So oh, all yeah. ed all edges that are part of the tree are tree edges. Oh, you you are referring to the right image, is it? Not on the left image. Yeah, yeah. The left image is the original graph. That's your original graph. The right image yeah, is the, the original image. graph. We cannot find out what is the tree and non-tree edge, is it? No, no. No. One, one. Only if you run a DFS will you get a tree, right? So you can start talking uh -huh. about edges, tree edges, and non-tree edges only after you have a DFS tree. Oh, okay, okay. So what you are trying now, four to five is not a forward and backward edge, but it's a cross edge, is it? Yeah, because because so, they are in the different branch. Exactly. Yeah, they don't. They are not a part of your direct family, your lineage or your ancestry. Does not have four, right? So, so can you label all the forward edges? So just it would be clear. All the forward edges in this. So what, yeah, what, zero to what about two to eight, sir? What about two to eight? What about two to eight? Also, two to eight. Where is also two cross edge, no? Two to eight. There is no edge, right? There is no edge in the original graph. Actually, see the original graph. There is no. So I think so. Only zero to three is the forward edge in this graph. Yeah, yeah. So see that the way I have uh, added them is I have added the forward edge first, back edge just next, and just last. Okay. Only one forward edge, two back edges. Yeah, and two two uh, two uh, side edges. Ah, uh, cross, cross edges. edges. Cross edges. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please come. Yeah. Who else? Yeah. Actually, sir, in the lecture, uh, it was like told that uh, forward edge means the pre and post indices of. The final vertex is contained in the pre and post indices of the initial vertex. Yeah, yeah. We'll, and we'll the come reverse to... goes for the back edge. Correct. Correct. You are right. And that is I mean... that part. We'll yeah. We'll look at that part. So that is the next thing we look at. So before we go to that, we we'll look at uh, the relationship between these things. The five to eight is forward edge. Which one? Five to eight. Five to eight is there? No, there is no edge, right? So see, you have. The forward edge, backward edge, cross edge, back edge, cross edge only works for edges which are there in the original graph, but which are not there in the tree. So five to eight is not there in the original graph. So you don't need to consider that at all. Okay. So.
so yeah no like it like which original graph 5 to 8 is uh... this graph right so there is a graph there is a tree the tree is also a graph but then i hope you understand that we are running the dfs on a graph that produces a dfs tree now there is a there are going to be edges in your graph original graph which are not going to be a part of the tree so those edges are going to be called non tree edges they come in three types they can be forward like this or back like this or cross like this so what was the statement you are telling the edges not existing in the original graph are called non tree edges right so, so the edges that are not present in the original graph Uh, sorry. Edges, huh? I'm sorry. No, no. The edges which are present in the original graph, but which do not form a part of the DFS tree, are called non-tree edges, right? Because they are not a part of the tree. Oh, the edges originally existing, but not in the DFS, are called non-tree edges, huh? Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. So there is a way to identify. just based on the pre and post index right cross indices what is what is what right what what kind of an edge are we talking about so pre post index is 5 and for the post index is okay so i just uh, le- let me just uh, discuss this part so i have to i have to do this uh, on a separate piece of paper Or sir, sorry is. for interrupting, sir. If suppose yeah. there is a edge between seven to two, then it will be the reverse edge, na? Seven, seven to, to two. Two. Seven to two, right? Yes. Sir. Seven to where is two? Seven to two. Seven to two will be a cross edge. Cross edge. Cross, cross edge. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yeah. cross edges between two different uh, families. Forward yes, and yes, back sir. edges are part of the same family. uh seven cross edges are between extended family so for example if one is your parent four is your uh, uncle or aunt yes yes no no right? got it sir. okay so you are talking about the branches is it yeah there is a branch between that, branches is a cross edge is it yeah yeah not in the same lineage so you are not there so edges which are not a part of the same family but are between between two different families right so or family trees yeah. okay not family trees but i hope you get it so yeah yeah right so let me go and uh, discuss this part not in the same level well uh, level might might also kind of slightly confuse uh, but uh, because in, in dfs there is no real level right in dfs we have okay maybe i need uh, the bigger one so there is there is the important result okay result that uses uh, the pre and post values in a dfs result so okay so if you have a u dot i'll, I'll call i'll call two edges uh, as u and v okay u and v One second, give me a second. U and V are two nodes. Okay, any two nodes. So one of these two things. It only happen. Okay, so. Just give me just give me one one minute. Yes, need to refer to one idea. This is called the parenthesis theorem from the textbook. Okay. 
okay so we have we can we have three types of edges right one is uh a forward edge there is a back edge not a backward edge but a back edge and a cross edge right so let me remove this so let's take forward edge right so I'll, I'll probably have to paste this whole thing here because it has a complete trap okay so this is the full tree right we have a full tree here now forward edges have this property if, if there is an edge from Let's say the edge is from u come u to v, right? So u comma v is an edge. So in this case, what is the forward edge? Zero to three, correct? Zero to three is a forward edge. Let us call it zero comma three. Now notice the pre and post values of zero. What are the pre and post values of zero? Zero and seventeen. Okay, so zero comma seventeen. For three, it is two comma five. Three, it is two comma five, right? So you, there is a relationship between these two. Now, if you have a forward edge from u to v, so whenever I say u, it is zero, v is three. The this interval, right? So pre comma post defines an interval, right? A time interval. This is two to five seconds. This is zero to seventeen seconds. Now notice what happens. The interval 2 to 5 is subset of, right? So contained in, right? I hope that notation is fine. Is contained in 0 to 17. Do you see that? Okay, so you can identify forward edges by, by noticing this relationship. So for forward edges, I'm now going to make it slightly abstract. Which are of the form u comma so u comma v is a forward let's say u comma v is a forward edge then following will happen uh, when will something be a forward edge so you you start exploring u and while you are exploring u you explore v right so i'll write this down while you are exploring u you explore which means u starts before v and ends after v. Therefore, u dot pre, right? So u dot pre less than v dot pre, which is going to be less than v dot post, which is going to be less than u dot post. Do you all agree with these statements? Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Okay, so forward it means it is going from ans from ancestor to descendant. So that means what? So if zero zero is the ancestor of three, which means while you are exploring zero, you came across three. Okay, and uh, therefore three's exploration starts only after zero starts. So u starts first. And then you it, you encounter v somewhere in the process, but you don't add zero to three, okay? Because three was explored by one. It's a depth first set, right? So zero three doesn't come first. Instead, this three gets explored or visited by one first. But then there is a link from zero to three. So you can't help it. And therefore, it's a forward edge. So while you are visiting u, you, you explore v, and this relationship happens, right? This is for forward edge. Any questions regarding this relationship? Okay, I hope that that is clear. Now let's go to a back edge. Back edge is what? Sir, sir uh, sorry, one question, sir. Yeah. Sir, this is true even in case where there is a uh, bidirectional edge. So then also it is true, right? I mean, bidirectional edge from? As in, so in case of three to two, there is an edge, directional edge. So if uh, there is an edge from two to three also, then no, no, sorry, that will be a backward edge. 
ah two uh, three will be a back edge yeah backward edge no, essentially what i'm trying to say is that uh, even if the edges and nodes have two way no two way edges two way directions then obviously in dfs only one of the edge will come into the tree right so even the other edge which we omit if it happens to be a forward edge then also this condition will hold true right yeah this condition will always hold so whenever you have one you have you have an edge of the form u comma v and v is contained v is intervals are contained in u then u comma v is a forward edge and vice versa right so okay you can characterize this forward edges by based based on this looking at pre and post values of the nodes okay, so we look at the back edge right back edge is 2 to 0 right now it's exact opposite of what's been happening right? so uh zeros two so u comma v right so now this is u comma v so this is still the same right so while the, the only thing that changes is the positions of u and v so for now i'll make it concrete and then i'll go back to abstract so u is what two and this is v is zero right so two comma zero so while you are exploring zero while you are exploring zero you came across two okay so while you are exploring v you explore u so v starts before u and ends after u right so this whole inequality is now going to be reversed so v dot 3 less than u dot 3 less than u dot post less than v dot post so is it just the order of the 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 which contains what changes so here in forward edge u contains v in backward edge v contains u that clear this uh, distinction this is not clear c there is an edge from u to v right so u to v and we are calling u is it 2 v is 0 yeah u is 2 v is 0 okay u to v and we are calling it a back edge because we are going from descendant to ancestor bottom to top okay so moment you go from bottom to top who who would have started exploration first top right ancestor starts first so v starts first and u was found when you are exploring v so v starts before u and ends after u sir when you say u contains v u is bigger than v is that right ah uh, u is uh, more is older than v right so that's what we mean which means u was born okay so that's a bad analogy but you start exploring u before and you finish exploration after v finishes exploration but in the node we have only the node number pre and post yeah so with these indications when you say that u contains v are we referring to the pre and post term? Mm. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't get the question. You said in the course of explanation that U contains V, right? My question is, if that is the case, then U is U contains V means U is bigger than V. Am I correct? Bigger than V in the sense U starts before V and ends after V. So when how, do say, really how do we really identify that one from the pre and post values? Yeah, from pre pre and post, right? So this is only for the three types of. We are looking at this from the. So the, yes, the re, pre and post values for classifying non-tree edges, right? Because you can't use this to classify. There is nothing to classify for tree edges. Because for a tree edge, also you could say that one contains three, right? So you start exploring one before you start exploring three therefore you can't conclude that three is a forward edge of one so that statement is not valid for 
tree edges right so this is only for non tree edges for non tree edges if you observe that u starts before v and ends after v then that's a forward edge u starts before v and ends after v and u stops because u is an ancestor of v right so that's the understanding so it is same for for both forward edge and backward edge and uh, no right so but that's how it is given no u starts before v and ends after v in both or v starts before u okay yeah it's, it's the, just the opposite right so u is an ancestor of v for a forward edge uh -huh. in a in a back edge u is the descendant of v or rather yeah u is the u is the descendant of v or other ways to put it other way to put it is v is the ancestor of u right that means it's going from that one is top down other one is bottom up is it correct yeah so back edge goes from u descendant to ancestor so uh -huh. therefore u will be contained in v so always the descendant will be the smaller guy and the ancestor will be the bigger guy okay because the ancestor okay. will have to spawn several people right so so many things are there so ancestor will always have a larger time interval than any descendant and that can help you find cross edge for sorry forward edge back edge now cross edges are also interesting because if you have a cross edge from u u to v then u dot 3 uh, u dot 3 comma u dot post right this interval is completely disjoint from v dot 3 and v dot post disjoint mm -hmm. meaning they, they they have nothing in common so you can again invoke the idea of different family if you notice 13 16 is disjoint from 6 comma 11 they have right have nothing to do with each other likewise 14 15 has nothing to do with 8 and 9 one is not contained in the other but more importantly they don't even share any intersection so they are disjoint intervals so disjoint intervals means cross edges one is contained in the other means it could be forward or backward whichever is the bigger one is the you, you have to make your forward or back based on whoever is bigger okay this is this uh, clear how we look at the pre and post values post values to determine the type of non tree edge yes sir yes. question about yeah. okay so no. Sir, yeah. forward and backward uh, edge is also disjoint. They are not disjoint. No, one is contained in the other. So this means that uh, this. What does this mean? It means u dot pre comma u dot post is one interval, and uh, what is the other interval? V dot pre comma v dot post. So we are not seeing by this by the values. So this interval yeah, is contained in the time. Okay. Yeah, this is inter inside that, right? So likewise, you can change the order here for the back edge. OK, so uh, what was the use of all this? The one use is if you have a back edge, that means you have a cycle. OK, so if you have a back edge, you have a cycle in a directed graph, right? Undirected graph is easy, but in a directed graph, if you do all this and you find that there is a back edge such as 7 to 0, that, that immediately implies that there is a cycle because you can travel from your ancestor to your descendant. And there is as per you have a time travel machine that takes you back from descendant to ancestor. Okay, therefore, there is a directed cycle. So 0, 4, 7, back to 0, back to the future or in this case costs okay so that is uh, one application of the pre and post values in a dfs3 so we'll look at we'll quickly look at dax so that is the last topic for today so we have the dax are called directed acyclic graphs right so this is a directed graph on the left 
but this is not a cyclic or a cyclic the dfs3 right what you got on the other hand is a directed acyclic run because it's directed and there's no cyclic okay so we'll be looking at directed acyclic graphs uh, because they they are very useful in encoding dependencies so dependencies meaning uh, for example dependencies among courses or the sequence in which certain operations have to be performed right so here i've taken a simple example from our program uh, so anyone who has completed foundation uh, will have to do max 2 stacks 2 and python right so of course they need to do max 1 english all that but i've just taken the liberty to remove those courses for now so you have to do max 2 stacks 2 python only then you can enter the diploma level right so i assume that you are doing data science diploma then that will enable you to do mlf okay only if you finish mlf of course this is my minor technical point so you can do mlf and mlt together but then assume that you can do mlt only after completing mlf right so then there will be a directed edge from mlf to mlt so this is a prerequisite of this only if you finish mlt will you be able to go and do ml practice only if you finish ml practice uh, then uh, you can do these two courses ai and deep learning and only if you have finished deep learning can you do reinforcement learning okay so this is uh, this kind of dependency is encoded in a directed cyclic graph okay so this cannot be cyclic for the simple reason that if there is an edge from mlp to max 2 that would mean that mlp is a prerequisite for max 2 which is absurd right so practically if you think about it this is a prerequisite for some course and then that course is again a prerequisite for this okay that can't happen so this is called a dag okay so dags are uh, very useful as i mentioned so you can do what is called a topological sorting of a dag meaning you can list courses in a particular sequence so that any two courses you take the prerequisite always comes before the actual course or rather whatever it's a prerequisite for so that's called a topological ordering so we'll do a topological ordering here so i'll just show you one so max 2 for example max 2 you can start with max 2 first then do starts 2 then python that will enable you to do mlf then mlt mlp you can do ai dl and then rl okay so if you consider any two courses here let's say max uh, python and mlt notice that python is in some sense a prerequisite for mlt so it comes before mlt okay that's the d so any two courses that you take in this ordering the left is a prerequisite for right that will always or, or rather you should always complete left and then only do right so that that will be maintained <clears throat> right so this topological sorting this ordering is not unique so you could also for example say do max to first then do python then stats to this is also a valid topological ordering after you do mlp you can do deep learning then AA, then rl okay so that doesn't disturb the ordering or rather that doesn't disturb the topological order so this is called topological sorting now the question is how do we topologically sort a given that uh, we should start with a vertex that has no incoming edges right no and dependencies so yeah, so no dependencies, nothing. I don't need any prerequisites to do max to stats to Python according to my graphs here. Therefore, we'll start with max two. Okay, let's say we start with max two. Now, once you are done with max two, so max two has no incoming edges, right? There are no prerequisites. So if you finish max two, what you do is you just remove it from your graph. And you when you remove it from your graph, you remove it from you remove all edges that go out of it also right so that's what you do now after this you take up the next course which has no dependencies let's say starts two. okay you do starts two and then you repeat the same process now you can throw away the starts two course from your memory hopefully you don't do that but then for topological sorting you can do that so once you remove starts two you are left with 
these courses. Again, the only course in this case, the only course that is having no dependency is Python. So you can add Python. And uh, once you add Python to your currently sorted list, you can remove that also. So you can repeat the process. You will do MLF, remove that. You will do MLT, you will remove that. Okay, now only course available is MLP, which has no dependencies. So you can remove that. Now we have two courses which have no dependencies. Here there is a, you can choose between one of them, right? So let's say AI and then DL and then RL. Okay, so that is the so idea of- Combate DL, RL and then AI. Okay. Ah, yeah, you could also do it the other way. Yeah, DL, RL, AI is also fine. Right, so you have that or that ordering is also valid, sir. But is it not similar to BFS? Uh, well, is it similar to BFS in what sense? Are you saying? Uh, BFS, like, we don't remove anything. No, like uh, in this case, the incoming edges are not there for match to statue to in Python. So actually, we have did, when we ran through the BFS algorithm, we did not see any such scenario. But had if we want to implement BFS on this, then the same uh, flow will maintain. No. We run BFS on this. What do you do? You will do max to either max to stash for Python. Suppose we take max to. No right. You will do MLF next. You do BFS on. If you do BFS starting from max to. Hmm. What will you say? You will say I'll do max two, then I will do MLF. Right? No, so actually, I... actually, sir, we did not see any uh, tree where uh, the starting three have no incoming edges. We there was always a one starting, always one root no, node. No? Here there are three root nodes actually. No, no. So see. BFS can be started from any node, right? So that is something we discussed at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, that is correct. That is correct. Okay. Except for that, yes, yes, I agree. Okay. So suppose in this case, the three, uh, considering that we have to start from only zero incoming edges, then there are three possible root nodes, which is match to stats to Python. Well, okay. Here we may not call it a root node because in the in the ordering we don't really treat it as a tree, right? The outcome is not a tree. It's a sorted, it's a topologically sorted list. It's a, just a sequence. Okay. Okay. We are not treating it as a tree here. We are just looking at some sequence of courses that uh, some sequence of nodes. Okay. Okay. So that's the difference. If you are to do BFS on Max two, that will end up going to MLF before it starts two and Python are done. Okay. 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 So that is topological sorting. So you might be asking now, uh, how is it related to a something like DFS? So there is a way to do topological sorting using DFS. Okay, I just quickly mentioned that before we finish off with uh, the next topic, which is longest path in DAX. So you can use this pre and post to do topological sorting right so the way to do it is uh, to use the to sort the nodes according to the post value so if you look at post value let's take this particular graph right so look at the post value notice that there are I'll take this complete graph, right? Where you have the non tree edges also. Okay, first of all, this is not a DAX. So, okay, assume that this is this is the DAG. Okay, this is a DAG where we have we don't have we removed these uh, non tree edges from the original graph. Okay, do you all are you all okay with that? You remove the non tree edges from the original graph, and you end up you 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 run DFS and you get this DAG. Okay, now you sort the nodes based on the post values in descending order. If you sort the nodes based on the post values in descending order, that will be topologically sorted. Okay, the post value. So, if you, whichever was Finish whichever finished the last. 
okay that is like one of the first entries in your topologically sorted sequence okay i'm not discussing this more than this uh, it's there in the clrs reference you can take a look at this uh, there is a very short three line algorithm do dfs and then sort the nodes based on the post value in descending order whatever sequence you get will be a topologically sorted sequence right so you can think of think about why that is the case uh, later on okay so i just i just mentioned it now so last last part that we will uh, do is longest path in dax okay this again sir has given one example in the lectures so assume that you have four five courses here 0 1 2 3 4 are five courses now you can do each course in one semester right you could, you could of course do uh, multiple courses in a semester but then you cannot do a course and it's prerequisite in the same semester right so if you if you start with one you can do zero only in the next semester okay so you can ask questions like what is the longest time that it will take for me to or rather what's the shortest time in, in which i can complete the degree okay so that will correspond to the longest path in a DAG. this is like slightly confusing because both shortest and longest are coming in the same sentence but can you all uh, you all see why it is like something like how, in how many like how many terms you can complete your degree minimum right. terms yeah what is the minimum number of terms in which you can complete the degree that will correspond to the longest path in your DAG. see the longest path is what any any path that you can think of will end up being shorter than that right any other so path is what a sequence of courses so here a path one two three would mean what you do course one in semester one course two in next semester and third course in the third semester so that will be one path so if you keep doing these things then how what how long will it take for you to complete the course okay so i'll just quickly go over the algorithm again so this is tied to topological sorting okay so as before you look at courses which have no prerequisites right so let's take one uh, okay in this case i've taken four so four has no prerequisites and this zero here represents the distance okay or, or rather uh, you can think of this as semester right so zero is the current semester so it takes i'm going to measure time that way so i start from four now i'm going to remove four from my graph right that's what we did in topological sorting so when you remove four you also update the value of the neighbors of four so if i do four in the current semester and then i will do zero course number zero in the next semester so i update this to one more than zero okay so now i can choose bit i have to choose one because that has no prerequisites so i choose one again i can do one in semester zero and uh, notice this this already has a one this has zero and this has zero so i have to if i if i can do this in one semester since one is a prerequisite of zero i i have to add one one more to this right is that logic correct uh like we don't add because one has a, a path of zero so uh, and uh, current path of zero is one so we still return it as one correct you're right yeah so what i said was wrong so this is you add one more to zero which is anyway same as this right so you don't disturb this okay maybe the semester thing is not really the right way to do it uh, it's better to talk in terms of path lengths right as sar has discussed so please scratch the semester thing uh, paths are better 
the path length right so the path length to 4 is 0 uh, and uh, the maximum length from the maximum length to 0 is going to be what is going to be updated to 1 now when you are removing 1 the maximum length to 0 is currently 1 and what this says is if i reach 0 from 1 the maximum length will still be 1 okay 0 plus 1 so 0 to 1 and then from 1 to 0 there is an edge right so the maximum length will remain 1 so i can remove it without changing this number but then these get updated right so this will become 1 this will also become 1 okay now i can remove the node 1 okay so this is the only node now which has no incoming edges so i add that here but then before deleting it i have to update these values currently the maximum length to 2 is 1 but then this says that the maximum length is 1 plus 1 so i can now update this to 2 okay i update this to 2 and remove 0 now i can go to 3 from 2 with the length of 2 plus 1 or 3 current maximum is 1 but then what this is saying is you can you can do a longer path of length 3 okay so that becomes 3 okay finally you add 3 here and so notice that how did this 3 come about so 0 uh, 4 0 2 3 okay so that length is 1 2 3 that is how this you have to interpret this 3 for 2 likewise it is 4 0 2 for uh, node 0 it is 4 to 0 1 4 and 1 are anyway having length is 0 right path length is 0 so this was i think a bit muddled up so did everyone follow the longest path in dax or was it confusing so can you recap on sir okay see the idea is maybe i have to this is not the right it's not the right graph to explain it so what we are trying to do is we are trying to find the longest path in this whole DAC, right? Uh, so, you want to find the longest path in the entire DAC, the basic idea is what? This is the basic idea. So, you have a node, let's say, let's say this is node 4, right? Some node 4, and uh, you are surrounded by I didn't explain it properly. I think for this, please refer the lectures again. Sarah has explained it better than what I've done here. So I kind of didn't do a proper job on this. So we might have to refer that. But I'll just recap what he has done. See, you have this is a part of a bigger DAC. Okay. So for now, just consider this node 4. So you can assume that these are the only incoming edges to node 4. Okay, these are the only incoming edges to node 4. So, what can you say about the maximum length to node 4? Okay, there are some hidden nodes here, right? So, you can let okay, I'll add this detail also. Uh, you can the maximum uh, path length associated with this node 2 right let's say 3 i can reach node node 2 in three steps i can reach node 0 in two steps and i can reach node 1 in say, zero steps right so that the longest path this has no incoming edges let's say so i start off here but node 0 has some other edges so i can the longest path in this DAC to reach node 0 is 2. So you are assuming this? I am assuming this, right? I am not showing you the full graph. I am assuming a part of the graph. I am only showing you all the incoming edges of node 4. But for each of these incoming nodes, I am telling you how long it takes to reach them, the longest path it takes to reach them. So based on this, can you compute the longest, longest path to reach 4? Four, right? So five, five. 
a four, right? So oh, sorry, four. 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 Right. So you will reach. You will reach via two. So whatever is the longest path two, one more than that is four. So you could reach four in three possible ways, right? Either via one or zero. So four can be reached in. So the node just before four can be either two, zero, or one. The corresponding distances are what? So if you reach via two, then it takes three edges to reach node two and one more edge. So the distance it takes is d. D stands for distance. So d takes four here. If you have to reach via zero, it will take three and one. Okay. So this is the idea that we are using. If you know the, if you know the distances of all the incoming nodes. Maximum distances of all the incoming nodes, then the distance of this node can be found out by adding one more to the maximum of these three. Is this idea clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, where where does topological ordering come here? It comes here because if in a topological ordering, two, zero, and one will be before four. So, if you consider any topological ordering of this big graph, I'm Of which I'm showing only a part of it. A topological ordering has to look either like this, or like this, or like this. You agree? I mean, so there are like six three-factorial permutations. I'm not, I'm not listing the whole thing, uh, but anyway. So I hope you get the idea, right? So zero, one, two is one topological ordering. Uh, two, one, zero is one topological ordering. Uh, one zero two is another top. One zero two four is another ordering. So in all these ordering, what happens? Zero one two should come before four, right? In any topological order. So the idea is, if you can compute the maximum path length for these three nodes before you compute it for four, okay? If you can compute these path lengths like you have done here, right? You have computed three. Two zero these path lengths maximum path lengths before you have computed it for four, so that will help you compute it for four also. Okay, is this clear? Why? What the basic idea behind longest path in DAX? Yes. Sir, so why didn't why did uh, why didn't we increment uh, zero like in the previous graph zero length? Yeah. So yeah. Now maybe we we'll start from first, right? So here we are. So we are doing two things simultaneously, right? We are following. We are discovering the topological ordering, and also updating the path length. So, so this four is going to be zero. Is that fine with all of you? Path length of four is zero. You can the longest path to four is zero. You you, you cannot reach four in any longer path than this. Yeah. So now we are trying to remove four from the graph. Okay. Update the path length of zero. Right. The longest path to zero is currently. I currently I know only four path length. Right. So I know that at least it can be at least one. One more than the path the distance to four. So I update zero. Okay. Now what I see is, I I I know for sure that. The longest path length to one is zero again because no incoming neighbors. So uh, this, this this is also frozen. This path length is also frozen. So now notice the current maximum value of node zero is one. The longest path to zero currently is one. The longest path via one is also one. Zero plus one. Therefore, I don't update this this value. Okay, was that clear? Yes. Sir. Okay, no. So you don't update, but you update this because earlier it was zero. Now I know that this is zero. So this is zero plus one. I can at least say that this has to be one. This also has to be one. So I I, I can now remove one, right? And uh, so now notice that zero is the zero's path length is now confirmed because there are no incoming edges. This this path length is confirmed. Current maximum is one, but then there is a new maximum that is possible. One, one more than one. Therefore, you update this to two, and you can remove the zero node. Current maximum is one, but you can do better than that. One more than that 
is 3. So you update that, you remove this. Now this has no incoming edges and that's the last node. So, okay, so if you have to think of this in terms of courses, then it will take one, three plus one, four semesters, right? So one semester, second, third, four semesters to complete the program. If this is the prerequisite structure for the five courses in your program, it will take at least four semesters to complete it. Okay, so that's all I had for today. Uh, any questions? Yes, yeah. sir. Can I ask? Yeah, yes. Uh, sir, do we have any session for the practicing questions? Yeah, we have. So the TA sessions are uh, the, 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 these things will be discussed, right? The PA questions will be discussed then. So both to like practice or and other questions also. So the coding questions will be discussed on Friday. Yes. The practice assignment will be discussed. I don't know when is the next TA session. Uh, tomorrow uh, same time. Tomorrow, right? Yeah, tomorrow eight thirty to ten thirty, right? So that we'll discuss. Uh, so it says open session, but then you you can discuss the practice. <coughs> Sir, I just have a concern. Like uh, in week three TA session, I didn't uh, attend it, but for week two, I have attended. Uh, but number of questions for practicing was very less. And uh, as you know, like PDS is tough, uh, tough subject uh, than others. So questions are uh, like uh, uh, we. I'm not able to solve question, or uh, maybe practice is very less. So. Uh. Okay, so more questions. I am not sure at this stage. One thing you can do previous year's papers you can. PYQ, can you take a look at PYQ? There'll be like a lot of previous year questions by now, right? Uh, but sir, uh, like uh, in uh, statistic and maths, uh, there will be a session or in many subjects like MLT and DBMS, uh, 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 in live session, we do have question practicing. But uh, uh, PDSA is tougher than those subjects. Then why do it, uh, we don't have uh, questions practice in this subject? Uh, okay, I am not, I don't have an answer now, but I'll maybe discuss this with the uh other instructors and see what, what can be done. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Okay, anything else, anyone? So YouTube, YouTube, YouTube link is available for this session, sir? Yes, yeah. This. Can you give it? You can look at the channel. The channel uh, would have been added by. Channel would be showing it. So the implementations that have been discussed in the lecture, like should we follow it or could we have an alternate implement, like implementations of longest path? I mean, in Python that, that has been done. Right. So, uh, so what you can do is uh, see the, the prob one problem with implementation, which I found out last week, right? While discussing is very tough to code live, especially long, long pieces of code, right? So like. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct, right. Uh, and reading, I don't like the idea of reading from written code, right? So that is very boring. So one thing that you could do is uh, use the textbook. Okay. But, uh, okay. Where, so for example, week four, right? So week four, this every single code Atul has written this written this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Might be a better resource. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Shall we close the session then? Yeah, yes, sir. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you, sir. Thanks.